Okay, so my kind of uh, leading question or thought for you guys is, uh, wouldn't it be nice if there was a way that you could be reminded of God and his lessons mm -hmm. all the time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? We often have a problem of forgetting God's lessons, so he has to remind us. But wouldn't it be great if there was a way to just constantly be reminded about God and all of his lessons? Well, I think God has done that in a way, or provided a means for that, in nature. So our topic today is, is nature in the Bible, and, and I do think that that was God's original plan for us by putting us, you know, man was originally put in a garden, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, many people have called nature God's other book, in a sense, right? And God teaches us lessons uh, uh, in nature as he does in the Bible. And so, um, but uh, we have to be careful with that as well. Because there's pagan societies who will base all their beliefs off of, of the nature. nature. And you know what's funny is they usually get their beliefs, uh, they get these weird beliefs incorrect based on a misunderstanding of nature. Mm -hmm. um, I got, uh, got a friend that uh, I was sharing about the fact that I like to go to nature because of the second book of God. And uh, she said, oh, oh yeah, I'm also pagan. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Please join Come us. Come here, join us here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Welcome. We just started. You didn't miss much. Yeah. So we're discussing nature in the Bible. And uh, yeah, that is, that is important not to, not to twist the lessons. I was thinking about how the Egyptians, right. and they worshipped everything, and everything was a god to them. And... Mm -hmm. and um, they worshipped the dung beetle, and I remember Walter Weiss talking about the reason why is they, they saw a dung beetle coming out of dung, right? Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, they thought that, mm -hmm. that, that it was spontaneously brought into existence out of dung. Yeah. Uh, no, it just lives there because that's what it eats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they thought this was this miracle thing, and so they worshipped the dung beetle. We don't want to make those mistakes, right? Okay, so I'm going to need some uh, volunteers to read. I have four verses here. So, who's going to take the first one? Psalm 19, Me. 1 through 3. Okay. Well, you have this one. And who's going to take Romans? We can do Romans. Romans? Yeah. Okay. 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 Romans. I read Psalm 20. Oh, she and then who will take Luke? I can do Luke. Uh, is that 24 and 27 or 22 and 27? Uh, 24 and. Okay. Yeah. James, take that. And then Isaiah 28? I'll do that. Okay. Okay. So this is just kind of our introduction to the topic, and we just kind of want to read through these quickly to get an idea. So, Mel? Oh, yeah. Psalm 19, 1 to 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor not language where their voice is not heard. All right. So what here are the things in nature that are teaching us some lessons about God? What are the things? Well, the heavens. The heavens. Sun, moon, and stars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have a telescope there in Mariposa, and at nighttime, man, oh. that is so true. Yeah. You know, we aim it at the sky, we can see stars, Jupiter, you know, mm. planets. Wow. Even that's fun. Crazy, yeah, and that's fun. It's, it's incredible. This is no accident here. This is the designer, creator. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the heavens, the skies, Teach us about God. Mm -hmm. which it declares His glory. It declares His glory. I think that's some of the most beautiful poetry okay. in the entire Bible, okay. the way it's worded. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. Okay. Mom, can you read Romans 1 19 through 20? Sure. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Mm. Okay. 
So what are the things there that I mentioned that teach us about God? All the stuff you make. <laughs> Everything, right? <laughs> Everything. Actually, I skipped 19 for some reason. No, it, was, it started in 20. Because what, oh. what may be known of God is manifest in them. What God has shown, has shown it to them, and then this is the creation. He's shown it to them through, yeah, through the everything that we see, basically. Okay. So, so far we got heavens and the sky, and we got everything. Romans is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And James, what about Luke 12, 24, and 27? It says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. Which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Mm -hmm. Alright, thank you. So, what are the things there that teach us about God? The birds and the birds. flowers. Birds and the flowers. Mm -hmm. Could we be even more broader in our categories? Nature. Uh, let's go. There's two <laughs> things: animals, animals and plants. 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 Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. These two examples Jesus gave. He gives one for an animal, and one for a plant. Mm. So, plants and animals teach us about God. Lessons, gospel lessons, and so forth. Mm. Okay. And Kali, can you read Isaiah 28, 23 through 26? Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning the soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed places, and the spelt in its place? For instruction, for he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick, and the cumin with a rod. Okay. So the key verse there, I think was 25 or 26, where it says... Uh, he instructs them in right judgment. God instructs, right? And so what does God instruct using in this object lesson? What's the object lesson there? What's the thing that he uses to teach? The earth. The earth? Yeah. Right? And what, what, what's going on with the earth? It's planting. Planting. Farming, right? Mm -hmm. Agriculture. So the, 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 normal, yeah. the normal thing that is happening around in the earth. Yeah, yeah. Right? But specifically here, it's, it's agriculture. Yeah. agriculture. Farming, right? And it's interesting. It mentions farming and agriculture, and then it specifically wants to tell us that God teaches us using those things. So, what we see here is a pretty broad category, and we can give more verses on this, but pretty much everything in nature, the heavens, the skies, right, the plants and animals, farming, agriculture, and Romans is just everything in general that we see that has been created, teaches us about God and teaches us lessons on salvation. So this is obviously something that the Bible repeatedly directs us to, to pay attention to. So, but here's a principle I want to keep in mind when we look at these things, and that is that the natural world that we see today is not exactly the way it was made at the beginning, right? We know that. Everything's not perfect like it was. So the fall has affected the way nature looks. So let's look at a, a verse on that, see if we can get some ideas on how this has changed. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And then verse 14. Can somebody read that for us? I'll read it on my phone, phone Bible here. I can read. Thank you. Uh, verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground for your sake, in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And Verse 18. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the, the herb of the field. Verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you, you are cursed with 
be your first more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Thank you. So, what specifically is cursed and changed? What, what's different now than it was? And I read those in a specific order on purpose, but you can go through in uh, any order you see them. Ground is cursed. The ground is cursed. So, if the ground is cursed, what would, what would that include? What's that going to affect? Yeah. Plants. Plants, all right. So, and we didn't read it, but verse uh, 19 talks about the practical implications of that. Mm -hmm. uh, farming's going to be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adam and Eve were originally supposed to tend the garden, mm -hmm. and it was probably a lot easier and more pleasant. <laughs> yeah, you just be. This is easy, right? Yeah. No, no more. Yeah, now it's fighting weeds. And... So, what else? So, farming, the, the plants. So, we will see that the plants have actually changed. They die. They die now. Before, there wasn't any death. Um, and they... Thistles. thistles. So, we got weeds. We have plants that are kind of changed in, the, in their purpose. We have things like uh, plants act way of oh, thorns. Thorns, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, Dr. Veith does a presentation on this. I think it's in Total Transformation, the first one. The first uh, one on that series. And he talks, because he's a zoologist, and he goes into the science behind it. And he talks about how animals have changed and how you can see in the plants and animals the way that they were originally designed and how it's been altered. Like you mentioned thorns, mm -hmm. and he says that actually a thorn, all it is is a leaf that has, it never opened up. It comes out and it's supposed to open, right? And instead of opening, it stays in this tight little curl mm -hmm. and hardens, and that becomes a thorn. The genetic well. Yeah. yeah. So the, so the ability for that thorn to just open up and not be there is in the plant, but it's been altered, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that there's this, it's supposed to be perfect, but God changed it and cursed it, and so now we have these problems. And he That's mentioned that. Go ahead. It's interesting, um, I had a conversation with my coworker the other day, and um, he's really, he's into reading a lot of books. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is in terms of humans also, he's talking about humans. Um, he talked about like um, how this one person was in uh, uh, was in Korean War, or Korean? Vietnam, Vietnam okay. War. Um, his hands were effect affected, and uh, something happened to his hand where to where he had only, he had six fingers uh. as a result of the war. But huh. then, but then as a result of that, um, his gene got tw uh, changed. And he got transferred to the next generation, to where his son also got a six fingers. So was wow. it a, was it from the chemicals that they sprayed? Yes, from the chemicals. Oh, yeah. okay. So I'm thinking, wow, wow, environment can change people. So I was yeah. thinking, you know, yeah. how did how did we get so many races today? We have blacks, whites. Uh -huh. um, maybe it got changed. Uh, uh -huh. Our genes got changed some, somehow. There's been some altering. Some altering. So yeah, that's interesting to me. Some oh, some is wow. more extreme than others. Like yeah. Six, yeah. <clears throat> interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a principle that we have to keep in mind because Charles Darwin, one of the reasons why he made the mistake of evolution was that he looked at nature and he said, he looked at a cat playing with a mouse and just slowly torturing and killing a mouse, right? We were talking about a cat yesterday and how the dog seems to have a little bit more empathy than the cat. Yeah. The cat, the cat is just doesn't, it doesn't really yeah. recognize yeah. emotion, yeah. you know? So yeah. The frontal lobe, the kind of frontal yeah. Lobe. yeah, that's frontal lobe, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so Charles Darwin was looking at this cat just being brutal and just that's torturing a mouse and slowly killing it, right? Mm -hmm. And he thought to himself, he couldn't imagine a loving God creating a situation like that. But what he failed to recognize, warning, uh, what he failed to recognize is that this was not God's original plan. 
this is it's been altered it's because of the curse it's not the cat wasn't originally intended to do that mm -hmm. you know probably played with the mice without killing them you know for fun, and for fun right <laughs> chase right i'm sure dogs and cats well, chased and, but then they didn't hurt each other there are examples of cats and like rats and stuff becoming yes. friends so, so we see glimmers of it yeah, yeah yeah absolutely um what was another one dr Vice talked about um mosquitoes and a lot of people, everyone hates mosquitoes, right? Mm -hmm. Summertime's coming, and I got a bad mosquito bite on my neck or something. And um, he talked about how actually, I don't know if this is every mosquito, I'm not a scientist, but he was talking about at least some kind of mosquito, that it's only the females that are the, the blood suckers, right? So maybe we can... But what he was saying is that um, it's because the females have to give birth that they need more nutrients, and so they... So the nutrients are the blood of the people. <laughs> so they go get blood. But the males have the same system, the same kind of poking and sucking system, and they use it to get nectar from flowers. Mm -hmm. And so he said... It, it, because the ground was cursed, and the Bible says it won't yield its strength, for some and reason the ground... also made it worse, too. Yeah, Things right. Things aren't as nutritious. And... Yeah, so because it's, it's, the ground doesn't have the same strength, the female mosquito cannot get the, enough nutrients from the nectar, mm -hmm. and it has to resort to, to, to blood, right? <laughs> but that wasn't the original plan. Lions, Isaiah says that uh, in, in heaven... Mm -hmm. The lion will eat straw like the, like the, uh, but now you give a cat, you know, if we were to try and make our cat a vegan, it would die. Mm -hmm. There's, there's chemicals that it doesn't get from, you know, so it's not our God's original plan. What else um, did you guys notice in the verse that's changed? We kind of already mentioned some of this, but, so the ground is cursed. What else? The snake is changed. The snake is changed. Mm -hmm. But how does it say it? Is it only the snake or what do you think? It says, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Mm -hmm. So there was a curse on all the cattle, but the snake gets more. Mm -hmm. an additional. It's, mm -hmm. it's more cursed than the rest. Mm -hmm. And we, we definitely see that. So all the animals have been changed. They're not exactly as they were before. Now they're meat eaters, whereas in heaven... The snake, a baby will be able to play with the snake and it won't hurt. Um, lions won't kill. The, the wolf and the, the lambs will hang out together, right? So nature has changed. So we have to keep this in mind. When we look in the lessons about God in nature, we have to remember the fall and take account of that. In some, some ways, I'm glad that the snakes cannot fly anymore. They have to crawl mm -hmm. because the snakes, after the fall anyway, they, they were not friendly. Can you imagine walking around and wondering if the snake is flying and all that? Well, don't they snake, have ones that jump off the trees? Huh? Don't they have some that jump off the trees? Yeah, but they don't fly. They, they, yeah. they, they jump. They just drop. You know? Yeah, they're so... If you go in the jungle, that's true. Yeah, scary stuff. Yeah. They're bad enough. I don't like snakes. Yeah. Well, there's the, and then there's still some that have the little residual, the small limbs, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Small little crawling limbs, so. I have a good idea. Apparently, and we don't, you know, it's, it's, from the Bible, it just says that there's a, there's a change, so we don't have, um, uh, but the, the idea is that if, if it says that the snake is going to now crawl on its belly, then the implication is it didn't crawl on its belly before. Oh, yeah. So yeah, in some way, says. it was... Fine or crawling or, or and I, that's where a lot of people think that you get the legends of things like dragons mm -hmm. is that it's not actually a legend it's something that was and, and the snake was altered yeah because they have wings huh the, mm -hmm. that's that's the idea so yeah. here's uh, um, here on the, I was actually watching this I think it was from uh, NPR or some kind of news and they were showing this uh, that there's this famous dinosaur guy he collects all these fossils. And so he's he, he's very well known in the, in the dinosaur world, but and then he partnered up with this other scientist who she does uh, uh, studies of bone, and so she, he she started eva evaluating a lot of the bones that he's been collecting through the over the years. What he found what she found was that these bones, the bone is hard tissue, right? Hard tissue. Mm. She was able to find soft tissue on these fossils. 
So blood cells. So that yeah. tell, that means that dinosaurs can't be like millions of years old. Absolutely, it cannot be. No, it's not, it's not possible. possible. Just no. if it's not possible, if it is, there's no way that you could find soft tissue mm -hmm. on these fossils from the dinosaurs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that it just opens up the whole door of how old are these real fo fossils for dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually watched the whole thing. I thought it was very interesting. It's, it's on NPR. It's pretty it's strong. Not. Christian or anything, huh? No, they're not Christians. Yeah. But they're yeah. saying that there's no way the dinosaur could be this old as predicted. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense yeah. for it to find soft mm -hmm. tissue. Yeah, there's all kinds of problems. Yeah, they found they found like blood vessels and yeah. Oh, there's no way. Wow. There's no way that lasted millions mm -hmm. of years in state. This is like a new big recent use. Yeah, wow. it is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Just right now, but of course they're not teaching that to high schoolers. No, no, they're just telling them. Oh, it's still millions of years. They still give them the the party line propaganda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's important to keep in mind the, that the fall has changed these things. Um, and, and like you said, we have changed things. And we've also changed animals too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, We're doing it now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have a chihuahua at home. And uh, we love him, but that's not God's original design. He would not survive that. <laughs> he wouldn't survive five minutes in nature. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, we have altered animals quite a bit. Some of the food we eat too are altered. Mm -hmm. the, the food we eat, absolutely. The, the plants and the seeds. I was, I was just watching something yesterday. I was talking about Roundup Ready plants and stuff. And we have very much altered things uh, to make them so they're not God's original plan. Uh, I saw something about the dinosaurs that, um, where they were talking about the Tyrannosaurus rex, mm -hmm. and there's speculation that it was um, a bred animal, that it mm -hmm. wasn't something that was originally uh, mm -hmm. just naturally, you know, they say it evolved, mm -hmm. but we would say something that God designed. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at it, it's a really horribly designed kind of uh, mm -hmm. animal, you know, with this little tiny claws, right? Mm -hmm. And they were saying that it's it actually doesn't work as a carnivore. There's studies where you can look at an animal and you can see how quickly an animal can make turns, like in order to catch things, right? And like an elephant would never work as a carnivore. Mm -hmm. you know, imagine an elephant trying to catch a gazelle. It just, it's too, it's too big and heavy. It couldn't make a turn quick enough, right? And uh, the T-Rex the is very big too, but how would it catch something? Well, it's not going to catch yeah, it with that. these guys, right? Yeah. So it'd have to catch it with its teeth. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, you look at the teeth, and when you look at like a a wolf or a lion, the the teeth, especially those you know those canines, go deep uh -huh. into the skull. Uh -huh. You know, you probably didn't know about this uh -huh. as a dentist, uh -huh. right? That you have to be able to to grab something that's moving thirty miles an uh -huh. hour and hold on to it. Uh -huh. You better have some very strong teeth structures. Well, the T Rex isn't designed like that. Its teeth are very shallow. And so if it tried to grab something with its teeth, which is the only thing it could grab, teeth would pop right out. It'd be, it'd be yeah. needing dentures very quickly. So it, they, it would work as a, a, a vegetarian, actually, which is, you know, that's not the propaganda. We see Jurassic Park and it's blood and gore, and, but that, that just doesn't work for the animal. It does, doesn't work. It wouldn't so have what the, what the original plan was. They are just alive. Well, we, I mean, you it's could imagine... Like you can imagine people breeding. I mean, I bet you a T Rex looked pretty scary, right? It's like kind of like taking a pit bull and cutting its ears so it looks creepy and cutting its tail and making it mean and putting a big collar on. I mean, imagine back in those days if you had a T Rex, it would look scary. I can imagine people, I don't know, or for whatever reason, people would breed lizards to look certain ways. And I mean, hey, if you can take a wolf and make it into a chihuahua, you can do some when, when, you are carefully breeding, you can make things look pretty intense. Mm -hmm. So this is just, just some thoughts to think of. But in general, the fall, I think, is something to keep in mind because it shows us that not everything we see in nature is exactly how God wants it. It's a little bit off mm -hmm. from the way he wants it, and we change things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think the fall shows that there is this battle between good and evil. I think the fall itself teaches us something because it is something that God put in place. It was originally perfect and he's the one who changed it and cursed the ground. Now he did it because we sinned. Um, it wasn't his original idea, but he did it also as to teach us some lessons. 
And so, um, you know, the thorns and thistles teach us lessons, right? Um, and so we see a battle between good and evil with the fall. We see beauty and also death in nature. And we see this struggle between life and death and, you know, these, these, these different animals fighting for survival and so forth. And this teaches us object lessons about, uh, about God and about salvation. So that's kind of a little bit of a background. Um, and there is so much that we could go into. I want to just mention a few um, <coughs> symbols that are used in Scripture and that are nature symbols and what they can mean, uh, what they're symbols of. And I think we won't finish today. We'll break this into two pieces. This study, which, by the way, we won't meet next week, uh, we'll be out of town. So uh, James is going to be out of town, too. So uh, next week, no, no class. And we'll, we'll get back together the following week. Um, so let's look at some of the symbols. And I, I think I'll mention that there's two points to keep in mind first. We've been talking about nature. And some people may get confused and think that we're just saying you guys should just go out there and, and go be a tree hugger and just, you know, the tree will talk to you and tell you, tell you about God and that's not what I'm saying. So the two points I want you guys to, to pay attention to is, number one, that the Bible uses nature as object lessons. So the Bible uses natural object lessons, kind of like parables in nature. Object lessons. So this is important because if you don't understand anything about nature, you won't get the lesson. Right? If it's using agricultural object lessons and you have no idea about agriculture, you, get it. you won't get it. Yeah. Right? And who is the Bible written to? Well, it was written to the Hebrews and, and, and people in, in Greek society back then, too, but these were mainly agricultural societies. Mm -hmm. So they understood the object lessons when they, were, when they were given. They kind of go over our heads sometimes. So I'm not saying you all need to be farmers, but you need to familiarize yourself a little bit with what these object lessons are. The second point is that nature itself teaches us about God, which is kind of what we've already been going over. And so a, a correct understanding of nature will teach us about God, but this does not supersede the Bible, okay? So you don't just go out in, in nature and have the birds teach you something and, and have it contradict anything that's in the Word of God. Don't misunderstand me, right? So nature itself teaches us about God. Okay. So let's go into some symbols here. Is it not uh, like what you said, nature itself teaches, it means nature itself reveals the glory of God. Absolutely. That is yeah. the creation. Like what the Bible says, right? That is right? the second book, right? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. why you said nature should not supersede the Bible. No. It's just a, just a revelation of God's creation. Exactly. Exactly. Well, going back to that Romans verse, yeah. mm -hmm. where it says, oh yeah, where it says that um, those that don't, the deny that there's a God, it's everywhere. You yeah. can just look at the phenomenon of nature and you have you you you're lying to yourself and thinking that that's not all cre that there isn't something that created the beautiful absolutely. intricate flower that's just absolutely. absolutely gorgeous in all the different varieties. Absolutely. But yeah. Yeah, I was talking to someone who's very smart, uh, and he's an atheist, but I could I, I could say that nature, look at nature, it will be yeah. Yeah. God. It should. Yeah. It should. <laughs> If you're unless you're That's humans like are really good evolution at lying to themselves. Is a, a masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. It's very it's very important for him to have this kind of block in our logic where we don't see the yeah. obvious mm -hmm. in nature. And that's what evolution is. So education is very important for sure about this propaganda. In <laughs> uh, a European society, you ask, you know, where did the bread come from? And the answer will be from wheat and the wheat from the ground. But here you ask and think from Costco. Yeah, <laughs> right. And this, this is a very important point. Yeah, we are we are far off. removed. Mm -hmm. We're far removed from this stuff, yeah. and it is good to get out into nature. We're going for a hike today. It's well, good, you know. Mm -hmm. Satan, I believe, has used city life to a large extent 
to put all these barriers between us well, and Well, all man-made stuff is around us. All man-made. Yeah. yeah. So we can't. Absolutely. Yeah. Instead of God-made. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not saying, For you know, your, your, your grocery store is bad or, you know, your house is bad because a man built it. God will use those as object lessons too. But, you know, get in nature and you'll learn some stuff about God. Yet Absolutely. the man-made stuff isn't even as close to as complex as what God has made. Uh-huh. Yet we say the stuff that's around us is Absolutely. created. Absolutely. <laughs> it's pretty silly. Uh-huh. So let's look at some symbols. And when you look at these symbols and you see what their meanings are, you can use this whenever you go in the Bible and you see some of these things listed. You can kind of get some object lessons from it. So I'm just going to list a bunch of symbols and you guys can help me uh, tell me in the Bible what they stand for. So water. What is that a symbol of in the Bible? And there's multiple answers to this. Multitude of people. people. Okay, absolutely. So I'm going to put another one under here. That's sea. The seas, right? Yeah. And, and seas or, or water. And that in Revelation 17 verse 15 says yes. it's a symbol for multitudes of people. Baptism. Absolutely. Lots of people. Um, so baptism, which we could, which is really just a symbol of life. cleansing, life. Right? New life. cleansing. Yeah, cleansing. What else? What else is water a symbol of? Life. Life. life? Absolutely. Life in general. If you were a Hebrew living out there in the Middle East, uh, word of God. water is, was life. Go ahead. Word of God. Water. The word is so God. The word of God. Absolutely. Oh, good one. It yeah. does. Uh, what's the verse? As the rain descends and brings forth the grass, so so will my word be. It will accomplish what I... I'm paraphrasing, but you guys... Yeah. yeah. Water is a symbol of the word. Anything else? Not John 4. Uh, somebody is praying, you know, uh, John uh, 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 3. The uh-huh. word is the same as a uh, spirit. Yeah, so absolutely. Somebody, uh, the word and the spirit are yeah, your heart. Word is, uh, absolutely, absolutely. We'll, we'll the word is the spirit and the word is the same. Absolutely. absolutely. How about the woman and the well? That, yeah, John 4, right? John 4, what is that? Everlasting life? Or living, ever water. Li- living water. Out of their belly shall flow living water. It would be like a well, right? And you will have the thirsty. So that's salvation. Yeah, salvation. Yeah. Salvation. Everlasting life, salvation. eternal life. Yeah. All right, life. So you can say eternal life. Uh, and actually, you know, actually, the specific that has to do with mission, you know, being eager to share what you receive, you know, you could flow living water. That's what she did. She went and told everybody else, you know, what she had found. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and she shared it. Yeah. Um, God Himself is symbolized as as with water because it's life, right? So all these things. Um, okay, let's move on to another one. You see, we could we could go for days with these kind of symbols. How about grain? Mm-hmm. What's grain a symbol of? Food. <laughs> it's food, right? But it's like the bread. Bread. The Bible. The word of God. So bread, which is what? The word of God. The word. The word. Of God. Absolutely. What else? Anything else? Anything else associated with grain? God's people. God's people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We are. That's right. Yeah. Um, what about the opposite? What would you think would be the opposite of grain? Wheat. Wheat. The opposite of wheat. Wheat. Oh. Weeds, Weeds. tears, right? And what are those? Uh, Wicked. The wicked. The lost. Okay. Anyone who's done any gardening can see why the weeds are so hated, right? (laughs) Okay. Um, What about? Also, isn't grain also um, people that are supposed to be harvested? Like not necessarily God's people, but like the harvest. Like people that are not lost, but. They are. Like, we're supposed to go out and find... Oh, like evangelism. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah, Jesus says, look to the fields. So, they are so. white white already to harvest. Yeah, so people who 
are right right, right for right. harvest. Yeah. Um, in Ecclesiastes, it says, "Cast your bread upon many waters, and it will come back." Right. This is the idea of sharing the. So that brings us to another one. Seeds. Do you think also grain means our lives? Because Jesus said, "Unless the grain falls down and dies." Absolutely. Yeah, so oh, not, not being people. our life, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So God's people, kind of, right? Mm -hmm. um, our, our kind of Christian life, right? Christian living. Christian living. What about seeds? What does a seed represent? God's fruit. It's it, God's the gospel. Gospel. Yeah. The word of God. Oh, the, the word. The truth. Right? The good seed, the sower went forth, mm -hmm. so good seed, the seed is the word of God. Um, in singular, okay. in singular, seed, seed. only, no plural, means Jesus. Yeah, it's, it, when it's singular, yeah. when it's just seed, it's Jesus. Oops, why not? And it could also symbolize, when it's plural, it's us. And that's in Genesis 3.15, the, the seed spoken of in plural. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, uh, plural is us. Okay. Man, it's 11. So, yeah, let's stop here. I've got a ton more symbols that we could look at. But the idea, you get it. And so when you see these things mentioned in Scripture... Even when they're just stories that don't seem, you know, Old Testament stories, you can draw some object lessons, typology type of object lessons, that you can learn from, from the students. And when you see these things in nature in your regular walk of life, you can also get some object lessons from them. So we'll continue this in two weeks when we come back, and we'll, and I have another lesson for you guys with the gold, seven golden candlesticks. Who would like to close with prayer?